We've mentioned this hadith of Ubay ibn Ka'b where the Prophet asks him what is the greatest verse and he says it is ayat al-kursi Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum Here are five quick statements that our scholars initially in the virtue of ayat al-kursi they highlight they say first the Prophet himself described it as the greatest ayat in the Quran second the Prophet ﷺ tells us, as we will study shortly, that in this ayah is Allah's greatest name. The name that when he is invoked with, supplicated to by, he answers the request of the one who asks. It is the greatest protection from the shaitan given to us by Rasulullah ﷺ. The Prophet said, number four, the one who recites it, after every prayer, the only thing keeping him out of Jannah is that he's still alive. The moment you pass away, your soul enters Jannah. And the moment the day of judgment comes, your body and soul enter Jannah. By the promise of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Number five, the Prophet Sallallahu said, the one who recites it after his prayer, Allah remains a guardian for him and sends guardians to protect him until the next salah. You are in a state of completeness, fortification from harm. Now I want you to understand that ayat al-kursi, there is no verse in the Quran, there is no section of letters that were formulated and revealed unto humanity that are greater than these words. Nothing in the scriptures that came before Muhammad Sallallahu nothing in the Torah, nothing in the Injil, nothing in the Suhuf of Ibrahim or Musa, nothing was revealed to humanity that was greater in might and more versed in meaning than Ayat al-Kursi, the verse of the Kursi. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu says, as is narrated by Imam al-Nasai, I was granted a gift from the treasures of the throne of Allah. Ayat al-Kursi was sent down to me Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. It is in a surah, the second chapter of the Quran, and it is the longest chapter of the Quran. The Prophet Sallallahu says, as is narrated by Imam Muslim, on the day of judgment, Surah Al-Baqarah will come in the shape of a cloud and it will cover the one who has memorized it and shelter him with protection. The Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu said about this Surah that the one who recites it and asks Allah for anything with firmness of faith, he will be given what he asked for. In this surah is this ayah, ayah 255 of the second chapter of the Quran. A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytan ar-rajim. Allahu la ilaha illa huwa al-hayyu al-qayyum. La ta'khuduhu sinatu wa la nawm. Lahu ma fi al-samawati wa ma fi al-ard. Man dha al-ladhi yashfa'u indahu illa bi-idhni. يعلم ما بين أيديهم وما خلفهم ولا يحيطون بشيء من علمه إلا بما شاء وسع كرسيه السماوات والأرض ولا يؤده حذبهما وهو العلي العظيم. This ayah is made up of ten sentences, and we're going to look at each one of those sentences to understand the inner beauty and the inner meaning. And the secrets that Allah has placed in it that comfort us physically, spiritually, from a health perspective, from a financial perspective, from an unseen danger, all of it mentioned from the verses and the statements of Allah and the sunnah of the Messenger Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Let's begin with the word Allah. What does the word Allah mean? Where does it come from? How do we understand it? 
The word Allah comes from Al, meaning the Ilah, God, the God, the only God. This is what it means in Arab. The word Allah was recognized by those who lived before Muhammad Sallallahu who were Arabs. And Allah says to the Prophet always in the Quran, if you were to ask him, perhaps, who created the heavens and the earth? They will answer you, Allah. It's not these idols that we worship. They would worship the idols in the intent that they would worship it, hoping a spirit in it would raise their prayers to Allah. They said we weren't clean enough to speak to Allah directly. And Allah rejected this subhanahu wa ta'ala. The word Allah is not foreign. When you look in Hebrew, and when you look in Aramaic, the language that Jesus spoke, and when you look in the ancient Semitic languages, you find that they use the word El, which means God, like Ilah El. So Allah begins this ayah in a unique way. He says, Allah. He doesn't say, La ilaha illallah. There is no God but Allah. No, He begins Allah first. Because everything and every statement in this ayah is a description and a discussion pinpointing the most important things you need to know about Allah. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he says, the word Allah, it means, it is a call, it is an invitation. Dhul uluhiyya. He is the one who is deserving of divinity. Wal ubudiyya, and the only one deserving of worship. And it is incumbent upon all those who he has created that recognize this from him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. We come to the next section. Allah, now he begins to tell us about himself. The first thing Allah wants you to know, the first thing he would say to his messengers, when Musa stands on the Mount Sinai, the first thing Allah says to him, Moses, I am your Lord. Take off your shoes. You are in a blessed place. I have chosen you. So listen to my instruction. What's the first instruction? I am Allah. There is none but me. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. La ilaha illa huwa. What does this mean? It means it disassociates, negates anything that claims to be worthy of worship. Anyone Anything, any person, any tree, any shrub, anything created, anything with purpose, anything that has been given shape, it disassociates itself from it. It negates its worthiness. It is not Allah. It is not worthy of worship. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala there is none that is comparable to him. La ilaha. Allah first begins by saying, nothing is worthy of worship. Illahu. So negation, and then for affirmation. Illahu, except he. You have to be a person who disbelieves in what is worshipped other than Allah. It's not just that I worship Allah and I believe in Allah. Before I can truly believe, I must negate what is seen as worthy of worship that is false in the sight of God. There are seven conditions to your belief. Tawheed has seven conditions. First condition is knowledge. You can't find someone in the street and say to him, Hey, say la ilaha illallah. They say la ilaha illallah. Say, okay, good. Khalas, yeah. <laughs> Ajallah. La. Allah commands the Prophet Sallallahu have sure knowledge that there is none that is worthy of worship but Allah. That's the beginning. Ilm. And therefore the first sentence given to the Prophet ﷺ is Iqra. Read. Learn. Recite. Ponder. Think. Understand. We are the ummah of knowledge. Second, how much should I learn? You have to learn enough that removes doubt that there is other than Allah. Anything that remains within you of doubt, it is your duty to go ask others until you get its solution and find the answer to your question. Certain, yaqeed, 
Third is acceptance. There comes a point in, in every one of our life. You're born Muslim, but sometimes you haven't reached there yet. You have to accept. There's some things that you must accept even before you have come to know it with certainty. So you, it's upon you to accept what Allah has sent you and verify it. But you don't reject it until it's certain. You have to accept what He sent you, what He asked of you, what He requested of you. This is why you find that those Sahaba who came to faith early on, you give them titles, Siddiq. He accepted what others would find unbelievable. Muhammad went up to the heavens, spoke with God, came back down. You believe this, Abu Bakr? Yes. Now you have to accept it. There is a compliance that you perform. It has to be only for Allah. Truthfulness is before sincerity. Once you become truthful between you and Allah, you develop ikhlas, sincerity. Where everything you do, you now want it to be only for Him. Initially in your life, you were doing things because people told you, people taught you, it was expected of you. You fasted Ramadan every once I'm not going to be the only one not to fast. But then you become, you come into a cycle where you look forward to the fast. You don't complain about the heat, you don't complain about the thirst. You begin to count its reward rather than its length. Finally, the aim of all of these six steps is to lead you to the last and most important, love. You want to do all of this because you love Allah. Those who believe and work deeds of righteousness, the ever merciful one, shall find for them love. Those who worship Allah with that love are honored by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They do that because la ilaha illahu. No one is worthy of it but him subhanahu wa ta'ala. al hayy al qayyum These are two words that when they are brought together they describe all of the names of Allah together. Any name, any attribute, any description, any sifa, any ism of Allah falls under these two. These two are the root of them. Begin that journey in discovering Allah. The ever living, the ever watchful sustainer of all things subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we talk about Allah living, He talks about you, He says in the Quran, you were dead, He brought you to life. And He talks about Himself, al Hay, the one who's living. His life and your life are separate. They are not the same. Life of anything is that it fulfills a function. That's the term of Haya. It has a purpose, a doing. It has a function that it fulfills. And therefore, life is to remain in the fulfillment of that function. Life really means I'm not dead. And with Allah, it's different. With Allah, it's eternality. There is no possibility of death. There is no possibility of end. Because there was no beginning. Allah was before there was I was the ever living subhanahu wa ta'ala. How do we come to this? Allah tells you in the Quran, don't you ever invoke with Allah another deity. Why? Because everything will be destroyed. Everything that was brought into being will be destroyed. The only one to remain is Allah, the creator and sustainer of all subhanahu wa ta'ala. To him will be your judgment, and you will definitely be brought forth to stand judgment in front of him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Which now brings us to that second section. He is not just living, but the function of his life, subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that everything that is, is sustained by him, azza wa jal. al qayyum He is not just the one who everyone is sustained by. He's the one who everyone is sustained by, that none can sustain them without Him. 
subhanahu wa ta'ala. He establishes himself and sustains everyone from himself, the Most High subhanahu wa ta'ala. All of the characteristics of Allah's governance, authority, creation, al khaliq al raq al mudabbir al muiz al mudil all of those characteristics they stem from him being al qayyum and therefore as is narrated by anas who the sahaba describe as being the one who would carry the sandals of the prophet he says whenever the prophet sallallahu was distressed he would say ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika astaghfir O oh Allah, through your mercy, I seek assistance. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So Allah is aware when others are not. And Allah assists when others cannot. Allah gives when others would withhold. And Allah is generous when others would not be. Allah is merciful when none would be. Allah is the opposite of His creation in His treatment of His creation. The one who protects you from Allah's anger is Allah. Subhanahu wa ta'ala. Al Hayy, Al Qayyum. The creation is maintained because of His order. And therefore, the next statement after Allah says, I'm the one who maintains everything, I'm the one who is ever living. He gives you an example. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. Neither slumber nor sleep overtakes him. It's in a way that it's not that Allah is saying he doesn't sleep although he's tired because he's busy. Allah doesn't even get tired. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم. Allah is not overcome. It doesn't compete with him with difficulty or deficiency. Not just that he chooses not to sleep subhanahu wa ta'ala. He faces no hindrance in doing whatever he wishes. He can sustain anything in being without difficulty. Affirming this attribute of eternal sustainability of Allah and everlastingness and infinite independent nature of Allah. لا تأخذه سنة ولا نوم Nothing ails him, nothing troubles him, nothing brings him to tiredness. This ayah or this statement in this ayah is repeated often in the Quran. To Allah alone is all that is in the heavens and the earth. Every dependent object belongs to him subhanahu wa ta'ala the one alone who is independent. They do not have any intrinsic power or strength in and of themselves. And therefore you, my dear brother, my dear sister in Islam, you look to yourself and you think strength. I'm standing, I'm sitting, I'm healthy, I'm wealthy, I'm young, I'm old, I'm married, I have a home, I have a bank account, I have, alhamdulillah, I'm capable. And then Allah can send something microscopic that you just inject, someone sneezes, not even a human. You breathe it in, you have nothing, nothing left. If you could, you would give all your wealth, all your health, all your ability. It doesn't even have to be you. You could have everything in the world and your son or your daughter becomes ill and you would give everything I have for them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala therefore says, Lahu, even you belong to him. You are owned, and therefore the greatest title given to our Prophet وسلم, is that he is Abd, a slave. One who recognizes his servitude to Allah. Every one of us is a slave to Allah, some of us just don't know it. You belong to him subhanahu wa ta'ala. Ma fi samawati wa ma fil ard. That power is only with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is only He who governs and controls. He is the sovereign Lord. So to Allah alone belongs the heavens and the earth. مَنْ ذَا الَّذِي يَشْفَعُ عِنْدَهُ إِلَّا بِإِذْنِهِ 
These are the questions that the scholars come up with when they recite this ayah. Who is there that can intercede or ask Allah to do something except if he prior orders them to do what he has asked? Who is sure of their words? And therefore the condition of shafa'ah is simple. Anyone who's going to petition Allah on behalf of someone, beginning with, with the master of shafa'ah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, are the three conditions. That Allah gives them permission and instruction. Allah says, Ya Muhammad, ask me. Allah is pleased with the one who is going to ask him. So Allah loves Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And third, that Allah loves the one Muhammad sallallahu will make shafa'ah for. Now I want you to understand that this is all related to the knowledge of Allah. Here Allah wants to tell you that even my Prophet sallallahu does not know about you and I what I know about you. And this is to put an end to this false ideology that you can ask Muhammad or ask anyone to ask Allah on your behalf after their death. On the Day of Judgment, the Prophet ﷺ says, as is narrated in Sahih al-Bukhari, there will be people whom the Prophet will recognize because of the markings of wudu. And as some of us come close to him, the angels will stand in our way. May Allah protect you and I from this. And the angels will drive away and push back people. And the Prophet will say, these are my people. Why are you pushing them away? Why can't they drink from here? Why can't they be given my shafa'ah? And the angels will say to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you do not know what innovative, what bid'ah practices they brought into the religion in your name after you left them sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. They're believers. But they did and lived a life contrary to what you had taught and added and embellished or detracted from what you had taught Ya Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So Allah then says, Ya Alamu Ma Bayna Aidihim. Allah knows what is before them. Wama Khalfahum and what is waiting for them behind them. The knowledge of Allah is definitive. His knowledge is of the past and of the present and of the future and also of the counterfactual. What would happen if he allowed it to happen? But it will never happen. Allah knows what you will be doing, Ismail, if you weren't with me now. وَلَا يُحِيطُونَ بِشَيْءٍ مِنْ عِلْمِهِ No one has that knowledge about Allah. إِلَّا بِمَا شَاءَ Except as and when He wills. Allah knows us in this life and He knows where and what place we will have in the next life, even before our death. This also means that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we do not know anything of His sifat. When Allah describes His hand or His face or time, the Prophet says, don't curse time, for Allah is time. What does this mean? We don't know. And we do not know of what Allah has in store of us. Anyone who tells you Jannah is like this, Jahannam is like this, even the words used by the Prophet and the words in the Quran, they don't mean the worldly pursuit, the worldly reality. The Prophet makes it very easy by saying, Jannah, paradise, no eye has seen it. وَلَا أُذُنٌ سَمِعَتْ No ear has heard it. And no human heart could ever comprehend or imagine it. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. وَسِعَ كُرْسِيُّهُ The kursi of Allah, notice I haven't translated it. And this is proper. The kursi of Allah extends over the heavens and the earth. This is the only authentic hadith that speaks about the kursi. Allah says, the seven heavens and the seven earths are by the side of al-kursi. And they are nothing except like a ring 
that you throw out into the desert land in comparison to the Arsh of Allah. And the Arsh of Allah forms the ceiling of Jannah. So what have the scholars said about Al-Kursi? Two known meanings amongst Ahlul Sunnah. Abdullah ibn Abbas, he said, the Kursi is the knowledge of Allah that envelops everything in his creation. Al-Imam Al-Hasan Al-Basri and some of the Tabi'een, they said, no, it refers to the attributes of Allah, that it is another name for Al-Arsh. It is a section of the Arsh that relates to his creation. Wallahu a'lam. Finally, Allah does not become weary to preserve them both, meaning the heavens and the earth and his kursi and all of his creation. And he is the most high, the tremendous subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is a part of your faith to make tanzih, to transcend Allah, that Allah is distant from what human beings can imagine. That Allah is separate from his creation in the reality of who he is subhanahu wa ta'ala. That Allah is not just, you know how it translates, Allah is the most high. I left it there purposefully. It's a wrong translation. It's not Allah, Al-A'la is the one who is most high. Al-Ali is the one who deserves to be highest in everything. And his sifat, his characteristics, his names and attributes also occupy that supremacy over all things subhanahu wa ta'ala. So that Allah in his essence, in who he is, is above everything that he has created. Everything is beneath and below him subhanahu wa ta'ala, the most majestic, the most high. It is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is qualified as having the highest and the greatest qualities. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, there is nothing that can ascribe or be descriptive of him except the highness in everything. He is the pinnacle of everything in our life subhanahu wa ta'ala. I wish to conclude with five virtues mentioned by the Sahaba about this ayah to learn its power in our life. First, Ali radiallahu anhu, he says, that Rasulullah sallallahu said that the one who recites it after every salah, nothing prevents him from Jannah, except that when they return home from their prayer in the masjid, that everything around them is protected. His house, his neighbors, even the surroundings of where he sits. Everything around you, even the one who hasn't read it, receives it. The second hadith, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, he narrates that ayat al-Kursi is the greatest ayah in the Quran. Whoever recites it in his house, the Prophet sallallahu said, the shaytan exits in hurriedness, runs away, from the house where Al-Baqarah is recited and in specific Ayat Al-Kursi is recited. Abdullah ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu, yet another Sahabi, he says, read, read Ayat Al-Kursi. It will protect you, your children, your home, and even the houses that surround your house. Also, Qatada radiallahu anhu arda, he says, Whoever recites Ayat al-Kursi on his sleeping bed that the Prophet taught him, وسلم, Allah sends two angels of protection who are given to him until hatta yastaytid, until he wakes up in the next morning. Final hadith of Ali radiallahu anhu, he said, I cannot understand how a person who is a Muslim and an owner of a has reason, has learned, is able to think, can spend the night without reading Ayat al-Kursi upon himself. If he knew the benefits in it, then he will never discard it under any condition. <laughs>